So thank you. I'm going to talk about uh, making secure two-party computation practical. And the outline is as follows. There are three sections. In the first hour, I'll just deal with the, uh, the background. I guess it's 20-year-old stuff. Uh, the, ha what secure two-party computation is, definitions, what we know about it on a theoretical basis. And then I'll describe the Yao and GMW protocols. So for those of you who are familiar with this, it's a good time to sleep after lunch. In the second hour, then, I'll talk about uh, efficient protocols for semi-honest adversaries, and I'll present a line of research which uh, um, I think is rather surprising, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll put it in this way. If five years ago, the common understanding was that the most expensive operations in these sort of protocols are cryptographic operations. And therefore, our, uh, in order to make it efficient, we have to reduce the number of cryptographic operations, where they, where they be exponentiations in, a, in some uh, group, or where they be uh, AES computations, or whatever it might be. And what's actually happening is that the cryptographic operations are now no longer the bottleneck, and we're actually finding that by doing uh, algorithmic op optimizations which are not connected to the crypto or other systems optimizations, we're actually getting huge speed ups. So we'll see how there's a combination of crypto algorithm systems, and this manages to bring uh, uh, incredible speed ups and things that I'm talking about, which uh, say uh, a year and a half ago, a, a paper was published which did something, uh, computed a massive computation in uh, four hours, and then this year we can do it in 11 minutes. That's the sort of speed up we're talking about. Uh, so things are really moving quickly in that space. And in the third hour, I'll talk about uh, uh, malicious security when uh, the adversary, and I'll, I'll define what semi honest malicious are, when the, a more stringent type of adversary, and I'll talk about also uh, how we can achieve efficiency. I'll focus on one particular uh, method uh, and, uh, and some recent breakthroughs that we have in, in, on that as well. Okay, so let's start with the basic background, what secure computation is. We have a set of parties with private inputs, and they want to join, jointly compute some function of their inputs while keeping their inputs private. And uh, this, the privacy and other properties I'll describe in a moment have to be preserved even if some of the parties are corrupted and are trying to attack the protocol in some way. And from a theoretical perspective, and this is why security computation has actually played a very heavy role in the theory of cryptography, this can actually model any cryptographic task you want to talk about. And, and almost any task you can talk about, even in security, you could model uh, uh, in this sort of way. And therefore, proving or understanding what can be done securely in the, in, in the context of computation has very uh, far-reaching uh, ramifications. What I'm going to focus more on today is obviously not those theoretical foundations, but how we're going to translate them, them into actually uh, things that we can use in practice. And I'll talk about applications also in a moment. Before we get to that, let's try and understand more what the security requirements that we want, for, uh, we want are in general. So let's talk about a secret auction. So a secure auction, sorry, with secret bids. So we want to know who the winning bid is, but we don't want to relieve, reveal any bid other than the win winning bid. Okay, there are some reasons why you may want to do that. So the first thing that we uh, uh, want to require is that since it's a secret bid auction and only the winning bid is supposed to be revealed, that means an adversary is only supposed to learn uh, the winning bid and nothing more than that. So this is exactly what we uh, mean by saying privacy, that the only thing that's revealed is the output. Right? So the other parties' inputs, which are their private bids, apart from the winning bids, should not be revealed. We also want to require, of course, that the winning bid is the one that wins. And you can't have some adversarial party who will actually make a lower bid, but will attack the protocol, the lower bid will be the one that wins. Uh, that wouldn't exactly be good for the, uh, uh, for the auction house. So for that, we want to require correctness. And also, there's another attack which is, a slight, which is a little bit more subtle, which actually can be carried out if you're not careful with designing your protocol. And that's where an adversary may want to ensure that it's always going to bid the highest bid. Now, if the adversary is bidding on a BMW and uh, bids uh, $10 billion, then most likely this will be the highest bid. So that's not going to be a very good attack. But let's say the adversary can somehow uh, make sure that his bid is always $1 more than the highest bid. Okay, then this would obviously be a very good strategy for the adversary and would go against what we mean by a, a, a sealed auction. You know, in a public auction, that's okay, but not in a sealed bid auction. 
And therefore, we want to prevent that. And what we're going to actually require is something called independence of inputs, which means that the, uh, uh, all parties have to somehow choose, uh, are, enforced, are forced to choose their input independently of the other party's inputs. They can't make it somehow depend on another party's input. And so they have to decide ahead of time how much they want to bid for the BMW, and they can't make sure their bid will always just be $1 higher than the other parties. So this brings us to the three main properties that we can talk about, which are privacy, saying that only the output is revealed, correctness, that the function is computed correctly, and independence of inputs, that the parties can't make their inputs based on others. And you can talk about this in many, many types of settings for uh, uh, privacy concerns, for uh, uh, privacy preserving data mining, uh, or essentially anything you can model, and these, these are the sort of requirements that you want. The actual definition, and we'll talk about it soon, will generalize these requirements into a more uh, a general sort of concept, which is very uh, uh, clean and easy to understand. Now, well, I want to talk about the different possible adversaries because when we talk about a definition of security, there are uh, two main parts that we have to sort of nail down. The first is what we define to be a break, so what are the security properties we want to get, and also what power we give the adversary. What do we assume about our adversary? Can our adversary, if it's encryption, we, you know, can the adversary only eavesdrop or can they inject messages? Or these are the chosen plaintext, chosen ciphertext. We have, to, we have to make an assumption on the adversary that we have. And hopefully when we translate our use into the real world, we're going to use the right assumption. Right? But, but uh, there are some settings where a weaker adversary is suitable and other set settings where, where it's not. And that's... Uh, um, that's already the second level, but it's uh, uh, important when we design a protocol that we clearly understand who our adversary is. So semi-honest adversary is a very benign sort of adversary who follows the protocol specification, but just tries to look at the message transcript of what's going on in the protocol to try and learn more information than allowed. So for example, if you had a protocol where one party sent the input to the other and then the other party did the computation, but it's all inside the, the application and the, so the party doesn't actually see it, that would not be secure because if you just look at the transcript, you can learn the other party's input. So it's actually non-trivial to achieve semi-honest security. It might sound, well, that's right, you know, it's a very benign adversary, they're sort of behaving nicely. That doesn't mean that it's easy. But uh, I'll talk a bit later about whether, uh, uh, when, in what sort of scenario semi-honest security can be interesting. A malicious adversary is a much more interesting sort of adversary or, or, or the sort of guarantee that we'd want. And it basically guarantees that you know, an adversary can't do anything, an attacker can't get, learn anything more than it's allowed to, or breach correctness or anything, no matter what they run. So they can use any arbitrary strategy, run whatever malicious code they want, they're still are not able to, to uh, uh, breach the security of the protocol. So that's a very, very strong guarantee. And obviously in general settings, what we want is security against malicious adversaries. A third type of adversary, which is a more recent one, but can make a lot of sense in a lot of uh, uh, commercial settings, is a covert adversary. And this is an adversary who can behave like a malicious adversary, so do whatever it wants, but uh, it's averse to being caught. And what that means is the protocol has an inbuilt mechanism which guarantees that if an adversary tries to cheat, then with some given probability that we know, a mathematical probability that we, we can determine, we can, we can decide, that, that that will be caught. So we can say that, yes, you can cheat, but if you try to cheat, there's a 90% chance you'll be caught. And then the adversary has to come along and decide whether it's worth their while, the 10, what their payoff is for that 10% versus 90%. And this actually fits in with sort of game theoretic approaches to security as well, because you can talk about the utility of the adversary and based on that, set the, uh, uh, set the deterrent factor or, or what probability you're going to catch the adversary. So that would make sense, for example, if uh, you have a, co a consortium of companies who, who are cooperating to uh, uh, run some sort of private algorithm on their data, but they don't want to reveal it to each other. And uh, if, a, if one of those companies gets caught, they'll be thrown out. And apart from their uh, losing a lot of face, they'll also uh, not be able to participate in the cons consortium anymore. And so that would be a good deterrent, and they wouldn't want to do that. You can talk about adversarial power, so polynomial time is the standard one, but actually there's also uh, uh, a lot of work which has been done on information theoretic security for physical computation. I won't talk about it in this talk. Another uh, uh, important factor when we talk about the uh, adversary is what do we assume about corruption? So there are static corruptions, which means there are good guys and there are bad guys. So the world is divided into good parties and bad parties, uh, adversaries and honest parties, and uh, that, that's the way the world is. And so when there are two or three parties running a protocol, 
We want security even if one or two of those or whatever are corrupted. But the assumption is that they start off corrupted and that's it. The adaptive model means that we're assuming that there's actually a sort of an external adversary who can come in and corrupt somehow through the computation, could corrupt some of the parties. And this actually leads to a different type of uh, setting. And, and why would this be interesting? Well, you can think of the fact that, well, essentially we're running a, a, a secure computation between servers and someone could hack into those servers, especially if it's a long-lived computation, like it's a secure database op application or something, then breaking into the server could cause a problem. And adaptive security is uh, harder to achieve. Again, I'm not going to go into it so much uh, or even at all uh, in this talk, but it's important to know that uh, in some settings you actually, it's important to have adaptive security. Okay, so let's try now uh, define security for secure computation. And what I want is a definition that is on the one hand very general, and the other hand gives us a very, very clear security guarantee. I want the, guarantee, the security guarantee to be clear enough that you don't have to be a cryptographer to understand what you're getting. The cryptographer should be working beneath the level of the definition of security, should be saying, okay, how do I construct a protocol that achieves this level of security, but it's really, you know, I guess, product management is gonna say what security we want. And we'd like some sort of definition that enables a high level clean, clear definition of security, of, of functionality and security, and then beneath that the cryptographer will start working in, and, and you don't have to be an expert to understand what you're gaining. Now, we're gonna, in order to do that, we're going to uh, um, use a notion of, and it's gonna start complicated, actually get simpler, but we're gonna use a notion of simulation like in zero knowledge. So we're gonna talk about the fact that if I can actually generate the view myself of what I see in a protocol execution, then it means I didn't learn anything. So essentially I see, I ran some protocol and uh, I saw information being sent to me, but for example, if it's all encrypted and I saw were encryptions, then I could actually just encrypt garbage and it would look the same to me. And so that means I'm not learning anything because everything that I'm seeing anyway, I could, I could just generate myself. Uh, that would be fine, but actually this is a big problem. We wanna try and define something like secure computation because in order to say that, uh, the, that what I see looks the same in a real execution and if I can generate myself, we have to somehow talk about uh, what the inputs are and what the outputs are, but what are the inputs even in this computation? Do we know what the adversary's inputs are? It, it's very, very hard to sort of formalize this sort of thing because the adversary has an input and that input def determines the output. But how do we know what that input is? It's not something which is necessarily even explicit. Maybe the adversary does sort of funny things and it, and like with the attack on the auction that it wants to make its bid be one dollar more than the, the, the highest party's bid. So what's that adversary's input? It's sort of not, not defined, it's not clear at all. So, the, so what we do instead is we go and say, okay, let's think about what would be the best thing in the world. And the best thing in the world is if we actually had some un uncorruptible, honest entity that everybody trusted. Okay, so uh, uh, without getting into theology, such a thing doesn't really exist, and even in, in the real world, even if we get into theology, it turns out there are quite a few possibilities for this trusted party, and then there are other people who no one trusts, no one, there are people who don't trust any of those possible entities, so we don't have any real trusted party in the world, but let's assume that we did. We had one entity that everyone in the world said, okay, this entity cannot be corrupted, everybody trusts this entity, and, 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 and let's use that entity now to do our, our computation. Well, what we can do is just tell all the parties to send their inputs to that trusted party, have that trusted party do the computation and send back the outputs. And of course, we'll have ideally secure channels between the parties and the trusted party. So this is really an ideal world because we have ideally secure channels, we have a trusted party that no one can corrupt, and that trusted party will do the computation and send back the outputs. It's very clear that in this ideal world, this computation is secure. Nothing is revealed but the output. Uh, and in fact, the only thing an adversary can do is choose its input. Because what happens, each party sends its input to the trusted party and gets back its outputs. The only thing you can do is choose your input, but that's a legitimate thing. It's legitimate to choose your own input, uh, you just have to make sure that you understand what that means. So in some settings, for example, if we want to run the millionaire's problem, so we want to know who earns more money, uh, does Yuval earn more at the Technion or do I earn more at Barilan, then uh, um, I can always lie about my input. Right? If I want to make Yuval feel bad that he earns 70,000 shekels a month, I want to say I earn 500 shekels a month and he'll for sure, whatever he, whatever he earns will be, will be greater than that. 
So that's, uh, uh, you, you have to make sure that if you're, if you're assuming something about the functionality and, and the real world number, which is, ex which is external, then we can't guarantee anything in the framework of computation. But once, given that a party can choose its input, that's the only thing that it can do. Now let's, uh, the way we're going to define security is to say, okay, so we have this ideal world where nothing bad can happen. There's just nothing an adversary can do because it's the ideal world. You can't corrupt, you can't, you can't break an ideally secure channel. Right? There are no SSL attacks on an ideally secure channel. And now we're going to require that the real protocol will look like the ideal world. Okay? So the real protocol, which is run in the real world with uh, uh, real parties and, and, and no, no external trusted help, will have to look exactly like this ideal world computationally distinguishable, essentially the same as this ideal world. And we can formalize that, but I really don't want to waste your time with that. It's much nicer to do it graphically. So on the left we have the real world, and in the real world the protocol is run. Hopefully it's a bit faster than that graphic. And, and then the adversary can output whatever it wants, right? Because it's adversary, we, we can't control its output. The honest party will output what the protocol tells it to output. And that's what happens in the, in, in the, in the real world. In the ideal world, the parties just send their input to the trusted party. The trusted party computes the correct output and sends it back. And again, the adversary outputs an arbitrary output, whatever it wants to, and the uh, honest party outputs the function, the, uh, the output of the function. And what we're going to require is that these two worlds look the same. Now let's try and understand this definition a little bit. And in order to understand it and get a feeling of what's so nice about it, Let's start by talking about the three properties of privacy, correctness, and independence of inputs. So I argue firstly that this guarantees privacy, meaning that the adversary cannot learn more in the real protocol than what it learns from the output itself. Now let's see why that's the case. Well, we said that these things look the same. These two outputs look the same as these two outputs. So individually it also holds. That means that this output looks like this output. Now in this world over here, what does the adversary have? just the output. It has no more information. So it means that this arbitrary output here is computed from its input and from its output, nothing else. But that means if over here for this guy could learn more, for example, if it learned more information about Y, about the honest party's input, then these would not look indistinguishable, they would not look the same, because in the real world it, could, it has more information and it can, can output something which is impossible to output in the ideal model, in the ideal world. But we said that these two worlds look indistinguishable. That's the guarantee that the protocol has. The protocol guarantees us that for every adversary here, there's an adversary here that makes things look exactly the same. And this adversary has no more information than just the output. Good, so we get privacy. What about correctness? Anyone see where correctness comes from? In the ideal world, it's correct. That means that there is some input that was sent here, and the, ideal, and the trusted party computed the correct output based on the input from here, and the input from here. Essentially this also means that we actually force the adversary's input to be explicit. There's an explicit input, even though the adversary might be doing very strange things, there's actually an explicit input that we force it to have. And we can learn what that is, that's what the security property guarantees us. So therefore correctness is also, and likewise independence of inputs, over here he has to send its input before it learns anything else. So it can't make X prime depend on Y in any way or on the output in any way because it hasn't, it hasn't got the output before it sends its input. So this is, this is our, ideal, uh, uh, our ideal real paradigm. And, and now you can see also why it's so attractive. What do I have to tell somebody else, so tell somebody who wants to use this thing? I can, all I have to say is under, th think about it as an ideal box. That's the, prop, that's the security guarantee I'm giving you, an ideal box, as if there was a trusted party computing this function for you. Now use that and plug it into your application. The guarantees that you have from my protocol, which are run directly between the two parties, is exactly the same as if you had this ideal box, ideal trusted party computing the function. It's a very, very clean and clear security guarantee. We're not getting confused with simulation and, and other funny things and trying to explain deep cryptographic concepts. No, pretend you have a trusted party and that's it. Okay, I said that off by heart, so I said that as well. Okay, so what do we know about the feasibility of this thing? Does, you know, this looks like a very, very stringent security requirement. Essentially, the, 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 the adversary's input is essentially explicit and, and, and it can't do anything except for choose its own input. 
it, it, it's, it's quite surprising even that such a thing could be done. But already in the 80s, this was, uh, uh, when this was introduced, there were really amazing theorems proven. So firstly, if you assume an honest majority, so if you have many parties and you assume the majority are honest, you can actually even do this information theoretically. So it means that even if the adversary is all powerful and can run uh, exponential time, it still can't do anything, can't break anything. You have to assume ideal channels between the parties, but, but uh, so, so you can actually do very, very amazing things with this. Without an honest majority, which is what I'm going to focus on here, because this is especially the two-party case, which I find to be most, of most interest in, in applications, but also it can be a small number of parties, like four parties where up to three can be corrupted. Even then, you can actually securely compute any functionality that you want. And if you think about this theorem, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And not only do we have this really powerful security definition that's really clear, to, easy to understand that and, and tell the world about, I can actually compute any functionality that I want. Right? So if it's privacy preserving data mining, or it's a secure, uh, it's a, a, a private database search, or it's a, a, a private genetic matching, or, or it doesn't matter what it is, whatever you want to do, anything you want to do privately, you can do. Of course, the only thing you have to add is in theory. Right? It's polynomial time, right? So it might. But can you actually, what, what do these feasibility theorems say about something in practice is actually a question that we really only started asking in a, less than, I guess in the last decade, but actually even less than that. And really in the last five or six years, and that's what the focus of this talk is going to be on today, in the three hours that I have, is how do these feasibility theorems translate into practice? And actually the most surprising part of this whole process is that when we, when we do things really, really, really efficiently today, we actually go back to the methods that were in the late 80s that were used in proving these feasibility theorems. That back then were seen as doing pure, pure mathematical results with no actual bearing on reality. And obviously if you want to do this efficiently, we'll have to look at completely different techniques. It turns out that no, we actually go back to those same techniques and we can utilize them in very, very surprising ways. Okay, so again, can they be realized in practice? What relevance do they have to, to, to real uh, applications? Now let's just assume for a moment that secure computation can be done efficiently. Then, as I said, it clearly has broad applicability. You can do anything you want privately. But is anybody interested? And I can tell you that when I started doing secure computation in uh, 99, I guess, uh, you know, it's, I was talking about elections and auctions, elections and auctions, elections and auctions, elections and auctions, but no one really cared. So that was fine because we were doing theory and theory is nice and, and you don't have to uh, argue that uh, for theory to be good, it has to be uh, necessarily used at that time. But, but has things changed? Is anyone interested? So, so this is the sort of the uh, uh, example that, that often proves the rule. People say, well, the only example anyone gives for practical computation is this one, so that proves that it's not practical. But let's talk about this project. There's actually uh, a sugar beet uh, uh, game theoretic auction that's run via secure computation in Denmark. And it's actually done every year, and it's a big thing. And, and, uh, uh, and so, so here's a real secure computation on a large scale that's actually used in practice. Okay, that's the only one essentially we know of. So let's talk about some other examples of things that have sort of been happening, and, and uh, uh, just to get the feeling of, you know, is it worth listening to me until 5:30? Well, it might not be, but but at least let's try and see that if 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 it's not too boring, then maybe it's worthwhile. So in 2008, I gave a talk at ACMCCS, and I gave an example of where would maybe where would you want to use secure computation. And at that time, was there was this thing in Israel where there, uh, uh, where um, uh, I can't remember what, what it was in 2008. If it was Likud and uh, uh, what's the name, the, the already, Kadima. If that was then, I don't remember anymore. Uh, but that, that they had a problem because they had they they claimed there were were people who uh, signed up for both parties, and then they wanted to find out, you know, each one sort of demanded to get the list of members from the other party. And, 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 and funnily in the States, actually being a member of a party is not considered to be private information, but I actually think it really should be, especially in the States where you have a local congressman who can say, well, you didn't vote for me, I didn't care. But, but, uh, but anyway, in Israel, it is considered private information, and this caused a problem. Well, I don't know if you can read that, but in 2012, I got this letter from uh, the Rashama uh, Miflagot, uh, which is the, I don't know how you say it in English, it's the uh, 
governmental uh, body who's in charge of everything to do with political parties. Okay, so they're the people who uh, uh, are in charge of the regulating the political parties. And they sent me a letter asking, saying that they want to do, they want to solve this problem and uh, they want to uh, put it into law uh, that, that this problem has to be solved using a secure computation. Okay? They don't really understand what they're talking about. So they're talking about encryption and having encrypted values and da da da. But, but this is actually something that they asked for. I, ga I actually gave them a proposal and nothing happened since then, but it's government, so who knows, maybe in 2040 they'll come back saying, yes, you remember that idea? Let's do it now. Uh, but in any case, this is uh, 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 a real uh, request, and, uh, and it means also that somehow that the word is sort of getting out that such things are possible, and so people are starting to hear that, 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 uh, uh, that this technology actually uh, can be useful. Yeah, that, that's a really good, yeah, <laughs> a helpful one for privacy. Um, yeah. Technology for breaching your privacy, they're very quick at adopting. Okay, so here's another request that I got from a couple of years ago, which was nice. There's some non-profit organization in New York that was given co a contract to research uh, uh, things related to criminal justice of illegal aliens in, New York, in the New York area. And they asked the US immigra immigration authorities uh, for the list of the alien registration numbers of aliens that are arrested in New York City and in order so they could contact them and, and, and I don't know, work out uh, something to which relate to what they're asked to do. Uh, but they refused, the, uh, um, the US Immigration Authority refused to give it over, uh, arguing that it was a privacy problem and therefore just give us your list of, of the aliens that you're in contact with, which they surprisingly didn't want to do, uh, not surprisingly. And so there was this problem and, and they were sort of about to sue each other and then there was uh, the woman who was one of the legal counsels in the teams, her boyfriend was a cryptographer. He said, one second, there's this technology called secure rotation. maybe you can use it. And then they sent me an email. So we didn't actually have a secure set intersection protocol that was actually wrapped in a, in a product that they could use. But again, there was an interest to try and solve a real world legal problem using secure computation. Here's a really funny one, okay? This is really, really funny. So, there are these, it turns out that astronomers are looking for a, so you can't read this, but they're looking for uh, transiting extrasolar planets, and uh, that means that the planet's silhouette passes in front of the star, and there are quite a few of these. Uh, so there are about one in 20,000 stars has a transiting planet. The problem is that there are, um, uh, lots of false positives. And once you, so once you find something which is potentially a transiting planet, you have to do a lot of work to check that whether it really is or not. And then you already know this, so wouldn't it be good to tell other astronomers or other teams, don't bother wasting your time on this planet because it's not a real one, it's a false one. This would be good for science all around. The problem is that if you do that, then the other teams know exactly where you're looking and what you're doing and sort of compromises your own research. So on the one hand, you don't want to waste resources between teams, but you do want to uh, um, also, uh, you know, sort of protect your scientific, uh, uh, you know, that you'll get the credit for what you're doing. So what they actually do is every now and then these teams will go to a trusted third party, they go to some astronomer who they sort of trust together and they say, listen, I'll tell you, you know, give him, here's my list of ones that I've ruled out and take their list of ones that they've ruled out and then let us know sort of uh, without revealing too much what information that's important for us to know. And they actually do this. And so this astronomer asked me and he had heard my talk at, uh, I had given a talk on this somewhere and he had asked me, well, can you actually give me a protocol that will do this and then we can do this securely. I said, I haven't got a product and he ended up designing a not secure protocol that just looked secure, but it doesn't matter. The fact is that there was sort of an interest. And you can think about this uh, um, actually very much in, in the uh, 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 realm of drug research, right? So here, a huge amount of money is wasted because different companies will actually research in the same areas and get to the same dead ends. Wouldn't it be great if there'd be some way they could actually tell each other there's a dead end here without revealing too much information so they could, you know, we could uh, save resources. Here's another example. And this is actually an example uh, uh, um, that uh, hopefully will go commercial soon. Um, so, 
uh, we're talking, I'm going to talk about here's the problem of authentication, but essentially it's applying secret implementation to a completely different domain, which is that of security and security cryptographic keys. So in, in just one example of instantiation of, of this uh, uh, idea, we have these secure ID things, right? So these one-time password devices, and these have a secret key inside. Now this secret key also sits in a backend server, and when you log in, what happens is that you send this number to the web server who sends it on to the backend server, and the backend server says yes, actually, then it computes with the cryptographic key on the current time and says yes, that's the correct one, or no, that's not the correct one. What happens if there's a server breach? What happens if someone breaks into that backend server and gets that key, or all of those keys, you have to go and replace these devices. That's very, very expensive. Okay, you have to go and replace all of those devices, and, uh, and, and, and apart from the fact that until you do that, you're completely vulnerable, or maybe until you even discover the breach, you're completely vulnerable, the, the expense afterwards is very, very great. But you could actually do this using secure computation. So instead of having the key sitting at one server, split the keys between two or more servers using a secret sharing scheme, and then run secure computation to compute the next one-time password. Now you can do this not only for one-time passwords, you can do this for database encryption or essentially any cryptographic key and apply segmentation not to the domain of privacy, but such a domain of security. Okay, so actually I'm involved in a, an in a commercial enterprise to actually try and get this, a commercial venture to try and actually get this uh, uh, to, to apply to actually uh, product uh, such a solution. And, and if you want to know whether it's important, well, if you heard about the RSA breach and Lockheed Martin was attacked because of the RSA breach, you also should know that this cost $66 million to RSA. But the $66 million that RSA is talking about is just the cost of replacing the devices. In fact, in terms of their PR and image, they lost even more money. So this is a real problem, not just to RSA, the, the, the numbers are actually amazing. So, so there are a lot of other applications of secure computation that are coming up, and there is interest, and, and I strongly believe that we'll see secure computation in, in, an, in a lot of places over the next, coming, next few years. So this is something that, that uh, it, it has become a reality, and has applications, it has good motivation, so stay awake, that's all I'm asking. All right. Not if you configure things correctly. If you configure things smart, you can put the servers on different operating systems, you can put them physically in different locations, so you have so the ones a physical uh, uh, access. You can make sure that the same admin doesn't have uh, uh, credentials to get into both servers, so you solve the problem of insider threat and of uh, spear phishing attacks. Nothing in security is 100%. You just make it harder for the adversary. So it depends how you configure it. If you put the, say, you know, two Windows servers next to each other in a room, then you probably haven't done very much, but you can do a lot better than that. Okay, so now we have these motivation, we have uh, the uh, government bodies, and we have the astronomers, and we have the l lawyers, and we have the security people, but how efficient is it, and can we actually use it to solve real problems? Uh, because five years ago I would have said, that sounds like a really nice application, the only problem is to do a yes uh, securely uh, with efficiency against the malicious adversaries, yeah, we, we, can, we can answer your one-time password authentication within five, ten minutes, I'm sure. Okay, so that wouldn't exactly be an answer that will, uh, you know, it's not, not the best uh, idea for a startup. But before we get to the question of how we can do it efficiently, let's talk about how we can do it at all. Because actually it's, it's, it's magic as it is. I mean, how can you compute without knowing how can you compute without ha holding the input, ha holding both inputs? It's a function of both inputs. Right? Most functions you can't separate into, okay, I'll do something, then you'll do something. Right? Especially if you think about AES with a shared key, or, or you think about set intersection. If I want to compute the intersection of a set that I'm holding and someone else is holding, I can't do a local computation and someone else do a local computation and then combine it. Right? It do doesn't work that way. So how can, it's, it's magic that this is even possible, so let's talk about the magic. And as I promised you, even though these, what I'm going to show you now is the basis of purely theoretical feasibility results from the late 80s, we'll see how actually they can be translated into things that can actually be run and, and used and, and reach extraordinary speeds. Okay, this is about Yao's garbled circuit. Uh, uh, this is a, a work from Yao, arguably between either in 1982 or 1986. It's not written in any paper. Essentially, uh, uh, someone heard it in a talk and told someone else, and then it, it went from there. Okay, 
So the idea is that we're going to represent the function to be computed by a Boolean circuit. Now those practical people in the audience will say, one second, if you're going to translate my AES function into a Boolean circuit, it's going to have tens of thousands of Boolean gates. There's no way this is going to be efficient. That you're going to have, really have to wait an hour to hear. Okay? But in any sense, we're going to represent the function to be computed by a Boolean circuit. And then what we're going to do is, for each wire on the circuit, we're going to assign random values. So there's going to be, when you compute a circuit, basically you have zeros and ones on every wire. And you, you go from the inputs, you propagate up to the outputs, and you assign a zero or one value to every wire, going up in topological order. So instead of assigning zero or one, because we're not supposed to learn anything, so you can't know if there's a zero or one at a on a certain wire, we're going to assign a random values, a random zero value and a random one value. Now since you don't know, I mean, random values look the same, you'll get a random value, but you won't know whether it's a zero value or a one value because they look the same. And then we're going to encrypt each gate, so that if you have one one of those garbled values, one of those keys on each of the input wires, you'll be able to get the correct key on the output wire, but again, not knowing whether it's a zero or one or anything. Okay, so I just said it's magic, and then I just gave you another thing which is also magic. How can you compute a gate, right, to give you values, random values on the input wires which represent zero or one, and you want to compute an AND gate, and you're going to give you the correct one after without knowing what you did. So in order to see that, let's just go slowly. So this is a simple AND gate. You can see by the truth table, so we have wires, input wires U and V, and output wire W. The first thing we're going to do, I promise, is we're just going to change the zeros and ones to random keys, or garbled values or keys. Okay, so for the U wire, we'll choose KU0, KU1, for the V wire, KV0, KV1, and for the W wire, KW0 and KW1. Okay? And then we have the following truth table. Now obviously this is not going, I can't give you this truth table, because if you give this truth table you'll know exactly where to have the zero or the one value in the output, right? Because you see that this appears three times, this appears one time, you know it's an AND gate, so then obviously the one appearing three times is the zero value, and the one appearing once is the one value. So I can't give you that. But I can give you this. I can give you an encryption of KW0 under KU0 and KV0, an encryption of KW0 on the KU0 and KV1, and an encryption of also again of KW0 on the KU1 and KV0, because those co all of those combinations lead to zero, right? A zero, zero, or zero, one, or one, zero, and an AND gate will lead to the zero value on the output. And I'll encrypt the KW1 key under the KU1 key and KV1 key. And I'll give you this table, okay? I promise you it's not that theoretical. <laughs> It's okay, just bombs flying overhead, I have to go. Uh, so, so I can give you these, these, these four encryptions, and notice that if I give you one value here on each wire, you can decrypt one row here. Obviously I'll also permute the order, so you won't know. So if I give you one of these and one of these, you can get one of those, because you're able to decrypt run one row. But you, not, you actually don't know what you decrypted. I mean, you know that you decrypted a row, you know the others didn't decrypt correctly, we'll have to show how you do that in a second, but you know the others decrypted incorrectly, and this one is the only one that decrypted correct correctly, so that's the correct output value. Is it a zero or a one? You have no idea. You just got a single value. Okay? So the actual garbage gate is like this. As I promised you, I permuted in a random order. And, uh, and now, as I said, when you're given one input, uh, one key on each input wire, you can get one key on the output wire, but no, without knowing what it is, and of course, you just combine these things together and you can compute an entire Boolean circuit by decrypting, or you can construct such a circuit by encrypting all of these things, and you can compute such a circuit by decrypting all of these things once for each gate. And this is where you start thinking, okay, this is obviously not, not efficient, right? I mean, you have to do AES or, or encryptions or for every single gate of a Boolean circuit. But again, be patient with that. One more thing we have to solve is what about the output? How do we get the actual output? Well, that's easy. If, it's a, if a gate is an, has an output wire and has an output of the entire circuit, then we just give you the translation. So we tell you, okay, when you got to the very end of the circuit, you got to the, the, the end of the circuit, you read an output wire. If you got K0W, then that's actually the zero value. If you got K1, KW1, then that's the one value. So now you can just translate it back to, to a zero or one. You could actually also encrypt zero or one at that last gate, but, but it doesn't matter. 
Okay, so how do we construct a, a, a garbled circuit from that? So I'm given a Boolean circuit, right? So we have bo some Boolean circuit that computes the function that I want to compute. And I assign garbled values to all wires. This is the first thing I do. I go over all the thousands and thousands of wires and assign two random values to each one. One I call a zero, one I want to call a one, but only I know it. I don't tell you what it is. And I construct all of the garbled gates using those wires. So I do all these encryptions. I encrypt all of these AND gates, XOR gates, uh, OR gates, uh, NAND gates, whatever the gate happens to be, I can just encrypt it exactly in the same way. I could actually even do things which are more than Boolean gates if I wanted to, but let's just leave it as Boolean gates because uh, it would blow up when it gets bigger because of truth tables. And then when I'm given a set of, if I construct such a garbled circuit, the property is if I give you one key for every input wire, that essentially represents a single input value. Because on every wire that's a zero or one bit, so I'm giving you one key for every input wire, that means I'm setting now the input to be computed. I can now give this to someone else who can now compute the entire circuit and get the output without learning anything. They have no idea what they computed. So we're not quite yet there to how to make this into secure computation protocol, but you have to understand that's the property of a garbled circuit. If I have a garbled circuit and I have one input, one input key, one key on every input wire, then I, that determines a single input for the function, and I can compute the output of the function but without knowing anything at all, except for the output. This is the way it would look when I'm combining these things together. So I have, this is the truth table for the A, B, so that's here. This is the, sorry, the garbled gate. That's the garbled gate for this, and that's the garbled gate for that. So I'm given one key here. I can go, I can decrypt according to, I can decrypt this. I can decrypt this one to get the K, C value, which is this one, and then uh, uh, I have the, the, what, the value from here and the value from here, and I use that into here and use that into here, and I decrypt and I get these two values, and I use the output translation table. Okay? Yeah? You said there was another quality that uh, you couldn't uh, decipher any row except the row for which you got Well, I'll talk about how you get that in the end. Yeah, you have to know how to get the right one. Yes? Just to make sure, the keys are not one bit long, right? No, no, they're 128 bit AES oh, keys. They're real keys, okay. They're real keys, that you, otherwise you could guess yeah. and you could get a good idea what's going on for sure. The 128 bit cryptographic keys for encryption functions. Okay, now in order to get to the protocol of TR's protocol, I have to introduce another primitive called oblivious transfer. And oblivious transfer is more magic. And the, the oblivious transfer function is, is, is as follows. A sender has two inputs, x0 and x1, and the receiver wants to get uh, one of those inputs, either x0 or x1, chosen by its input bit b. So xb, x sub b, is either x0 or x1, depending if b equals 0 or 1. Now that's pretty easy to do, right? The receiver can tell the sender, okay, I want the first string, and gets x0. Or the sender can send both strings to the receiver, and the receiver will take the one that it wants. With oblivious transfer, we don't want either of those things to happen. We want the receiver to get the one that it wants, without learning anything about the other string, and we don't want the sender to know which string the receiver got. This is a paradox, right? How can, you know, if the sender doesn't know which string the receiver got, it has to send both strings. But if the receiver is only allowed to learn about one string, how can it only learn one string without telling the sender which string it wants? So this is, this is, this is a paradox. This is something which shouldn't be possible in the real world. With cryptography, it's possible. Let's see how to do it. And it's actually very, very simple and very, very cute. Very, very nice. And a really nice application of public key cryptography. So with the sender, it has inputs x0, x1, and the receiver has an input bit b. And x0 and x1 can be strings, not, not bits. So the first thing a receiver does is samples a public-private key pair, PKB, SKB. So for the bit B that it, it wants to get, it, it samples a, a public-private key pair. As you'll see in a moment, we'll do, use El Gamal. I'll explain why El Gamal, not RSA, in a second. So it samples that. And then it samples a second public key where it doesn't know the secret key. I'll tell you how to do that in a second. And then it sends both of those public keys to the sender. So the, the receiver sends PK0, PK1 to the sender, and notice it only knows one of the secret keys. So it can only decrypt under one of those keys. 
The center then simply encrypts x0 under pk0 and x1 under pk1. The receiver only knows the secret key for pkb, so it can only decrypt the ciphertext cb and it gets back xb. So the receiver, notice that the receiver can only learn one value because it only has one secret key, and the sender has no idea which value the receiver got because both pk0 and pk1 look exactly the same. Now how do you actually do this thing in practice? Well, think about El Gamal. What's an El Gamal public key? It's a group element. Whether it's a elliptic curve group element or a, a group element in a, in, in, in a, in a subgroup of, of ZP star, it's, it's, a, it's just a group element. You can sample a random group element, that's a public key that you have no idea what the secret key is. Okay, so you can actually do this very efficiently using El Gamal. And then the receiver only learns one string and the sender doesn't learn anything. What, what's the first thing that bothers you when you hear this though? Right, what stops the receiver from, from just choosing both public keys and there's a secret key? So you have to say, well, if it's a semi-honest receiver, then I promise you that he's going to behave nicely. But you can actually uh, uh, force the receiver to only know one private key using some nice tricks, like making sure that both keys multiply to a, a group element that we know the receiver doesn't have a discrete log for. There, there, are, there are protocols, we, we, can do this, we can do this very, very nicely. But, but in order to, to just to get the feeling of how such a thing is done, that's enough what I showed you. Okay, so why am I talking about Oblivious Transfer? This is nice, it's very cute. We can actually show this to high school students and, 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 it's, and, and they can understand what's going on. Recommended not to do primality testing along with RSA for that. Uh, now, so how do we use this to do Yao's protocol? Now we're ready to show you the whole Yao's protocol. The first thing is party one constructs the circuit. He constructs this garbled circuit. Right? All these encryption tables, so I choose all the random values, constructs all the encryption tables, and then it's, sorry, I didn't say, but party one sends that circuit to party two. So party two now has this garbled circuit, but it doesn't know anything. It doesn't have any keys on the input wires. So it just has all these encryption tables, all these, all these ciphertexts. So then what party one does is it sends party two the keys that are associated with its input on its input wires. So this is a circuit computing something where, say, party one has 100 bits of input and party two has 100 bits of input. So party one's 100 bits of input, it can just send the keys that are associated with its input. Now it sends, so if its input is 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and so on, then it sends the 0 key the first one, the 1 key the next, the 1 key the next, the 0 afterwards. P2 gets this, it now has a key on every, on every wire of, that's associated with P1's input, but it actually knows nothing about P1's input because it just sees a random key. It doesn't give any information about P1's input because it's just a random key. The problem is, how does party P2 get its own keys for its own input bits? Right now we have these other 100 wires where P1 knows the 0 and 1 key, and P2 knows its input bit, and somehow has to get the key that's associated with its own input bit without telling P1 what its input bit is. And P1 can't give it both keys, because if it gives it both keys, it'll be able to decrypt the circuit and learn stuff. What is this? Oblivious transfer exactly oblivious transfer. So if I have oblivious transfer, now P2 can get the keys that are associated with its input bits. And once it does that, so it gets to use oblivious transfer for these, for example, then it has one key from here, one key from here, that's from P1's input. It has one key from here, one key from here, that's from the oblivious transfer, and it can compute the whole circuit and get the output. P1 learned nothing about P2's input because P1 just sent a garbled circuit, and use the oblivious transfer to send keys to P2, but oblivious transfer teaches it nothing about P2's input. P2 learned nothing but the output, because it's just got a list of random keys for the input wires, and it had just decrypted stuff the whole way through, and in the end got, got to output translation tables and got output. It learned nothing but the output. So you see there can actually compute a function, whatever function in the world, because every function in the world we know can be translated into a Boolean circuit, I agree that if it's a quadratic algorithm on a one gigabyte database, this is not going to be very friendly, but it can be, can be co converted to a Boolean circuit, and then you can actually compute this Boolean circuit and get the output without learning anything whatsoever. Right, so this is, I've been doing this 15 years and I still find it exciting. This is really amazing. This is really, really nice stuff. Right, this is really nice stuff. Okay, that's Yao's protocol. The problem with the AS protocol, if we want to start thinking about how efficient this would be, well, AES circuit has, say, 30,000 gates. If you're talking about 30,000 gates, you need 
well, you have double encryptions for every wire, right? For every, you have four double encryptions for every gate. So now we have to do eight AES encryptions for 30,000 gates, so that's uh, 240,000 AES encryptions. Doesn't sound very friendly. The receiver also has to decrypt and it has to try all rows. It has maybe you know, a few less, 150,000 encryptions. And they have to do all these oblivious transfers as well, which involve exponentiations because they involve Elgamal encryptions and decryptions. Doesn't look like something that we can really use, but, uh, um, but we'll get to that later on. So now let's talk about another approach, which is the GMW approach. GMW approach is a completely different way of doing secure computation. And uh, here the parties interact in order to compute each gate. So one thing about Yao is, in Yao's protocol, one party builds this huge garbled circuit and sends it to party P2, and then they do a little bit of oblivious transfer, and then P2 computes, so there's very little interaction. In GMW, they actually interact on, interact on every gate of the circuit. So what happens is initially the parties will XOR share their inputs. So for every bit of input that I have, say XI, I'll send a random bit RI to the other party, and I'll locally store RI XOR XI. And that means that actually the XOR of what I'm holding and the other party's holding on that wire is actually the correct input bit XI. Okay? And they'll both do this and the protocol will preserve the variance, the invariance, sorry, that at every point of the pro every wire that's being computed, so every gate that we compute, what we're going to get after that gate is that we both hold random bits that XOR to the, uh, um, to the correct value on that wire. Okay? Now, let's think about how to compute gates. So we have NOT gates. Well, to compute a NOT gate, just enough for one party will flip its bit. Because if you think what happens is, we both, now in GMW, we're not using 128-bit encryption keys, we're just holding random bits that XOR to the correct bit on, on, on that wire. So if, I'm hold, if we're both holding bits that XOR to the correct value, and we're going through a NOT gate, and the other party leaves its bit unchanged, and I flip my bit from a 1 to a 0, we're flipping the value of that bit. So it's exactly a NOT gate. So just a local flipping of a bit by one party is all you need to do to compute a NOT gate. What about XOR gates? To compute an XOR gate, the parties can just locally XOR their shares. Um, by the way, if there's questions, you can please, please feel free to ask uh, at any time. So, Hmm? No, every, every wire is separate. So in, every, in the beginning we, we just prepare all, we, we use a different random value on each wire. But what we have is that our XOR value, our, the shares, that, the bits that we hold are random under the constraint of the XOR to the correct value. So if I'm holding a zero, you're either holding a 0 or a 1, and that will determine whether the bit is, whether the correct value is a 0 or a 1, and, and we don't know anything apart from that. So I don't know anything, my bit is random, but under the constraint that they ex XOR together to the right value. So in order to compute an XOR gate, I claim that all the parties have to do is XOR their local shares. So, so P1 has alpha 1 on the first wire and beta 1 on the second wire, and P2 has alpha 2 on the first wire and beta 2 on the second wire. So essentially the correct values are alpha 1 XOR alpha 2 and beta 1 XOR beta 2. And what happens is each party is locally XORs the value, so P1 defines the bit, its share on the output wire to be alpha 1 XOR beta, beta 1, and P2 defines its bit on the output wire to be alpha 2 XOR beta, beta 2. Now this is correct because we know that alpha 1 XOR beta 1 XOR alpha 2 XOR beta 2 is exactly equal to alpha 1 XOR alpha 2 XOR beta 1, XOR beta 2, and that's the XOR of the correct values. So yes, they hold shares of the correct value. So just a local value that actually I have to interact. So I said, I promised that they'd be interacting at each gate, and I actually lied to you. For not gates and XOR gates, and I have to interact. They just do local computation. We get to an AND gate, it gets more complicated. Actually, not an AND, it's, 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 it's essentially any gate, but let's see how they can do this. So now they have to compute alpha 1, XOR alpha 2, and beta 1 XOR beta 2, and this is the problem because one party holds alpha 1 and beta 1, and the other party holds alpha 2 and beta 2. And if you open this up, then you have this pro cross product of alpha 1 with beta 2 and alpha 2 with beta 1, and you can't compute that by yourself. So no, no more local computation here. So how can we do it? Well, notice that P1 knows alpha 1 and beta 1, 
but it doesn't know alpha 2 and beta 2. If you think about what that means, is that there are four possible values for the output value, depending on alpha 2 and beta 2. Right? There are because the two bits that P1 holds are fixed. So they're just two bits it doesn't know. That means there are four possible values for the output wire. So P1 can prepare a table of all four possible values. Right? So it knows, it, it says, okay, well if alpha 2 is 0 and beta 2 is 0, then the result is going to be alpha 1 and beta 1 by just plugging in 0 here and 0 here. And it's going to say, well, if alpha 2 is 0 and beta 2 is 1, then this will be the result. Right? To be concrete, if alpha 1 is 1 and beta 1 is 0, then it just builds this, this, uh, 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 this, list of four, this table of 4, essentially, saying, well, I don't know what B2 has, but if it had this, then this would be the result, and if it had this, this would be the result, and so on and so on. And then the parties can want a, a 1 out of 4 oblivious transfer. We saw a 1 out of 2 oblivious transfer where the receiver chose two public keys, one which it didn't know. Now it can choose four public keys, three of which it doesn't know. And it's only going to get one value. They can run this 1 out of 4 oblivious transfer where party P2 will input the... For example, if its input is 0, 1, it'll input 2. It wants the second one. Or if its input is 1, 1, it'll input 4. Now actually P1 won't put 0, 1, 0, 0. What P1 will put in is this sort with a random value and will keep the random value to itself. So again at the end of this step, they'll have shares of a random bit. Okay? That's the GMW protocol. It's very, very simple. The only problem with the GMW protocol is it requires the oblivious transfer for every single gate. Now if we talked about 24,000, sorry, 240,000 AES computations doing uh, 200 or, or, or yeah, 240,000 exponentiations, say in El Gamal exponentiations, is really going to kill you. All right. So, so actually, for many, 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 many years, in terms of efficiency and practicality, uh, GMW was considered to be a complete no-no. In addition to that, uh, as, as I'll say here, if we compare them, Yao is a constant number of rounds. You just send the garbled circuit to the oblivious transfers in parallel. Whereas in GMW, essentially for every layer of the circuit, you have to interact. You don't have to do, interact separately for every gate, but for every layer you have to interact. So if you have a deep circuit with hundreds of uh, uh, layers, which you probably would have in practice in many, in many functions you want to compute, then you need many, many rounds of communication. So, so GMW has that uh, disadvantage. Another disadvantage that GMW has, we said that Yao actually uses uh, symmetric operations most of the, for, for everything except for the, the OTs on the input. So it uses asymmetric operations just for the input, but the rest is symmetric operations, whereas GMW is using uh, uh, asymmetric operations for every gate. So Yao seems to clearly beat GMW when it comes to efficiency. GMW does extend naturally to multi-party, which has other advantages, but it looks, when we look at the feasibility result, that Yao, uh, uh, Yao is, 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 the, is going to be more amenable to to achieving efficient secure protection, and uh, we'll completely turn that over on its head in, 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 in about three quarters of an hour. But, but at least at this stage, and this, when I say this stage, uh, uh, it's uh, definitely 10 years ago, and in terms of what people thought, even though no, the knowledge was there to start thinking it may be otherwise, until two or three years ago, this was definitely the, the common belief. Okay, so, yeah, got a question? Okay, so GMW and Yao are both, uh, they prove feasibility, um, but how efficient can they really be? They involve a lot of communication, they involve computing over a Boolean circuit. This doesn't seem to be something which is uh, uh, going to reach real-time speeds. So if I have, a, again, a 30,000 gate circuit to compute AES, I just have to transmit, not only have to compute 24,000, 24, 240,000 uh, AES computations, I have to send 120,000 ciphertexts, if each ciphertext is uh, 128 bits, then you can do the computation for yourself. On, that's, a, that's a lot of uh, communication. Okay, another question that we have is, okay, so as we showed that's only good for semi-honest adversaries, what happens when we want to get security from malicious adversaries? And that's exactly going to be the third part of my talk. So in the next second part of the talk, I'll talk about semi-honest adversaries and how efficient we can get and what techniques we have and also why it's interesting because we really want security for malicious, and then I'll go into talking about what techniques we need to get to malicious security and, and, and where we are in terms of its cost. I want to, before I proceed though, a parenthetic comment which is actually, uh, it's under debate, 
but it's worthwhile talking about. The protocols that I showed you now are general protocols, right? They talk about a, uh, a, a general Boolean circuit for computing the function. Should we actually even be interested when I'm talking about efficiency in looking at such functions, such protocols? I mean, it makes a lot of sense and it seems very clear that if I want to compute set intersection or I want to compute AES, then I should try and utilize specific properties of that function and build a protocol which is tailored around that function and not try to use generic feasibility protocols that use Boolean circuits. That, that's what we would think. The problem with that approach is that specific protocols have limited applicability. So if we want to convince the world that you can use secure computation and I construct something which is really great, but a tiny change can change things. So if I might construct a really efficient protocol for secure set intersection, but then my customer says, yes, that's fine. I want a set intersection protocol, but I only want to reveal the output if the set intersection is larger than 20 or smaller than 100. Suddenly my specific protocol completely breaks down because it, this tiny change can make it be completely, uh, it doesn't mean a tiny tweak to the protocol, it can complete, completely break, completely uh, make it, render it useless. But if I have a general protocol, so I had the circuit, and now I just have to slightly change the circuit to take into account some constraints. So that's the disadvantage of specific protocols. And secondly, um, even though intuitively gen, gen, uh, general protocols would seem to be less efficient, in practice, it doesn't seem it's the case. In fact, for, pro for functions like AES, which are sort of like very crazy sort of functions, we don't know any better way than doing it via Boolean circuit, and we can do it actually very, very well. Uh, and for even functions like set intersection, depending on what the parameters are, actually it can be most efficient to even do that via Boolean circuit, not via specific protocols which are tailored to it. Or at least there are arguments that there are papers that will say, here, this is better than the general, general one, and this will say, no, the general one is better by optimizing either one's protocol. So it's an open question, but definitely it, it's definitely clear that uh, uh, coming up with really efficient generic protocols will help uh, impact practice because I can now answer gen general needs. Okay, as long as, of course, I'm efficient enough and I can be quick enough to, to, do, what, to do what's necessary. Okay, so that's the end of the first talk. If there are any questions before I go to the next part, now's the time to ask. You talked about uh, computing functions. Yeah. You talked about one iteration function. What if uh, the scenario is slightly different? Let's think about an auction. Yeah. And uh, I'm a malicious adversary. And, uh, Let's say we're, auction, we're bidding for something and then I'm posting one dollar and the, the honest broker says X1, not you. So I say, no, 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 there's something wrong. Let's do it again. And I'm posting ten dollars. So by, you know, by posting it iteratively, I can actually find out what, yes. how much this X... But how can you claim that something went wrong? Well, because in the practical world, said, you know, let's take uh, elections. Somebody might say, no, I want to, I, we need to do a recount of the vote. Right, so, in, in, so firstly what you're going into, f firstly uh, the guarantee of the protocol will be that you can't, nothing, if it's triggered to malicious reason, nothing can go wrong, so, or you'd have to have some sort of proof, you can't just say, in election you can't just say arbitrarily. In terms of elections though, what you actually hit is, is, is a very interesting point, that many years ago we realized that the problem in doing a secure election is not the cryptographic protocol. Because elections have a lot to do with uh, uh, voter, uh, um, uh, the, the voters have tr trust the system, that you have a paper trail, etc., etc. But I think that Alon Rosetti is going to talk about that, right, uh, Yuva? Alon is going to talk about elections, right? So he'll, he'll talk about that, and, and there are actually the majority of issues that are necessary, uh, uh, the, the, big, the big problems that arise is sort of combining a cryptographic protocol in a setting where uh, you have a paper trail and you can actually check things afterwards and, and users can know what they, what they vote is the correct thing, etc, etc. So yes, in that sort of, if you have something which is related to, again, to, to user belief, then, then this is going to be an issue. Um, you have to take into account when you build it into an application.